just Wolf speaking at the podium at the NFL Combine, that is for major decision makers. That is yep. for GMs, team presidents, and head coaches. It's not for uh, some guy who doesn't have much sway. And and look, it, it, as we all thought, Elliot Wolf had a huge imprint on uh, the direction of the coaching staff, who may have talked to, who may, may have hired because of his contacts, because of his years in the league. And there's no question in my mind that after yesterday hearing from Mayo, that it is Wolf and Mayo. Mayo's the head coach. Wolf is directing personnel and everything flows from there. He is Greg Bedard. I am Nick Cattles. Therefore, you are listening and or watching the Greg Bedard Patriots podcast with Nick Cattles. You guessed it correct. And this episode is brought to you by FanDuel, the exclusive wagering partner of the CLNS Media Network. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. Well, yesterday, Greg, we had the coordinator press conference. But let's start with the man that's running this thing in Gerard Mayo your takeaways from Mayo and what he had to say during that presser. Uh, well, first of all, there was nothing really earth shattering in this. Um, you know, I guess my overall impression or my overall takeaway from the session with Gerard Mayo is that I still, I just have this feeling that this is a really green staff. Um, I think he's really green. I still think they, are working through some things. And, you know, while I do think he was more confident than his introductory press conference, or not to say he wasn't confident, um, but, and and he presented a little bit more of a vision. um, I still feel like this was sort of a process that was, uh, what's the term? I guess I would say that it it was um, not haphazard. That's not the right word. More like, uh, you know, by the flying by the seat of their pants. That that they're really. I, I'm sorry, and I think you feel differently, Nick. I I don't think that there was really much of a plan. I don't think that Mayo had much of a vision. And it, we've talked about this in the past. And that you know, look, he he hasn't had the interview and. He hasn't had an interview with another team in over two years. We don't know if he had any interview with the Patriots. And I just think that um, <clears throat> my my overall takeaway from this was that that he just sort of – he got the job and then it was like, okay, now what do we do? And that's been sort of every step. Like, all right, now what are we going to do? And, and that's not to say that he can't be successful as a head coach. It's just – it's unusual. You usually have a head coach who has been thinking about this and drawing up plans for a very long time. Um, but I don't get that sense with Mayo. And it sort of comes off from the question that I asked him about uh, being a defensive coordinator and being going up against schemes that that are you know really good and on the cutting edge of the NFL. And like, did he think about that at the time? Did he have that in mind with his hires and, you know, his his answer, you know, wasn't clean, and and that's fine. I don't indict anybody. You know, I I talk like I have marbles in my mouth, so I don't really you know care about him having a polished response. I just think that he didn't have a great response. He talked about Cleveland and how he was sort of impressed with them. The Patriots wiped the floor with the Browns the two times they played them. Um, so <clears throat> I guess that's sort of my uh, overall takeaway from it is that um, it feels like a coaching staff. Uh, with training wheels, especially working as a whole. I'm sure the offensive guys know what they're doing because a lot of them have been together, and Alex Van Pelt talked about that. But as a whole, with Mayo uh, at the head of it, it just seems like they have training wheels on at this point, and they're just trying to find their way. So there's a couple of things. Do they have training wheels on? I believe they do have training wheels on because this is the first time that Mayo's ever done this, and that's how it works. Do I think that means he doesn't have a plan? or didn't have a plan, that's where we disagree. You are right. I disagree with you on that. I think one of the things, though, to move this conversation forward instead of a bunch of retread back and forth that that we've had before, I thought about this over the past, I'd say, week. We all understand that Gerard Mayo was supposed to take over in 2025. That was the plan. If you drew this up perfectly, Belichick would have 
you know, beaten the Shula record as Patriots head coach, he would have rode off into the sunset, a nice peaceful transition to Mayo. And I just have to wonder, Greg, between that being the plan and Mayo not having a ton of connections, the first thing I've got to ask you is, would it not make sense if Mayo was thinking, when I take over, Bill O'Brien or Josh McDaniels is going to be my guy? That, that's, that's my guy at OC. You know, McDaniels, obviously, when he got fired from the Raiders, maybe Gerard looked at that and said, well, he could be my next guy. Maybe he thought O'Brien could be his next guy. And then things went so badly last year, and there was so much leakage about, oh, Mayo's rubbing people the wrong way. I look at that and I have to wonder, did Mayo have to change course because it ended much differently than he anticipated? And maybe he was planning going off of what the plan originally was and that it wouldn't end so badly. That makes sense? Uh, it, it does make sense. I, I guess, you know, my, my comment on that would be, uh, th- and this isn't anything against your opinion. This is just my, my thought. Um, this is the New England Patriots. Um, this is the successor to Bill Belichick. Um, I'm not cutting anybody any breaks. Um, this is, it, and it's hard. It's 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 harsh for Mayo, but that's the case with a lot of guys following a legend. That um, it's not ideal circumstances, and it's it's going to be tough sledding for him uh, um, in the early going for sure. One of the things, though, Nick, I will point out that I thought was one of the most insightful things that um, that Mayo had to had to that he said. Um, and I can't find it, but I'm I'm gonna paraphrase paraphrase it. But he said that basically um, the coaching staff is sort of like a work in progress. Ideally, you want this first coaching staff to be great, and everybody's gonna be great at their job, and and all this stuff. But it, Mayo said, but the reality is that's probably not the case, and so we'll make adjustments as we are going on. That is absolutely, and and it sounds like he he got that from talking to other former head coaches, things like that. And I thought that was absolutely spot on, that you get this with a lot of guys, as we see like with Kevin Stefanski right now, basically blowing out most of his offensive room, in st- in, including um, Alex Van Pelt and Scott Peters, the new Patriots offensive line coach, among others. Um, these guys are are trying to fight, find good fits, but realistically, they're not all going to work out. It's sort of like draft picks yeah. or free agents. They're all not going to work out. So I thought that was very insightful and showed showed me a lot that Mayo um, is already thinking on those terms. Yeah, I just have to wonder, you know, again, because I, I challenge the idea that many people have had that he just didn't have a plan. I, I don't believe that Mayo and or Wolf walked into this thing blindfolded. And so I, I do wonder if plan A was McDaniels or O'Brien figuring he'd take over in 25 after Belichick left. And I think plan B, from what I've heard, plan B seems to be Zach Robinson. And then Robinson goes to Atlanta with Raheem Morris. So then you've got to go to plan C, which I think was Nick Cayley. And like you and I discussed earlier this week, was it a money thing or was it Cayley negotiating with the Patriots and then going back to McVay and saying, this is what they're willing to give me? And did did McVay up what he was making out there with the Rams including the promotion, including the easier path to a head coaching gig because you have now been blessed by the presence of Sean McVay. So I just, we'll never know the answer because it's not like we can ask Mayo, hey, what was your plan, Gerard? You know, who was at the top of your list? It was obviously not Alex Van Pelt. But I do think there is a plausible scenario that can lead you to believe Mayo had a plan. It's just they weren't, able to execute the plan a few different times because of different situations, which ultimately led them to Alex Van Pelt. I did think Alex Van Pelt saying that he hadn't really been involved until the Wednesday night. I thought that was, you know, surprising. But then later in the press conference, Greg, he mentioned that he did speak to Elliot Wolf before he came in and that they kind of had a running dialogue. And I wonder, I ask you, I wonder, because we talked about this earlier in the week, the idea that maybe Van Pelt could have been in line for the Ben McAdoo position. Maybe that's what Wolf was talking to him at first, 
And then well, they got right. on the phone and said, hey, how about OC? And Van Pelt flew in. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's possible. I think some people have even I – mean, Bert certainly was kept reporting that um, – that their idea was to go with a young OC with a, another coach on top of them. And that would have been Van Pelt. And instead it's, they got the experienced guy in Van Pelt and they have um, McAdoo, which is um, interesting. And I, and like, like we talked about before, I do think that the offensive staff is set up for success because of, uh, of the uh, alignment that they had. And, and I don't, I don't have a big criticism for much of the stuff we heard from Van Pelt. I know some people like Felger or, are you know talking about you know <laughs> fitting the scheme to the player having an issue with that every oc says that and every every oc oc should do that and it's going to be a revolving thing that he doesn't know what the finished product is going to look like right now i don't have a problem with that you're basically going to put the bones in and then w- the way that it goes from there determines on what kind of players you have Absolutely agree with you, and I'm glad you just brought this up. We're going to get into Mayo's comments about Wolf because both you and I took a lot out of what he had to say about Elliot. But I just want to add this to what you just said because I think it makes your point even better. So I just saw the story, ESPN.com, about the, the Raiders press conference with Luke Getze. And, you know, here's what's written on ESPN.com. Let me grab the writer's name. I think it's Gutierrez. Yes, Paul Gutierrez wrote this. Just don't typecast Getze when asking what he wants in a quarterback. Here's what Getzey said at the press conference, quote, there's not one in particular. I think you've got to play into the players that you have and the things that they do really well. I think that's what's cool about this draft. There's a lot of different types of guys, and it's about who can do things to the level that it's a difference maker. You try to get as many dynamic guys on your team as you can. I wouldn't ever want to box myself into a corner with one particular style. That is exactly what Alex Van Pelt said yesterday. I mean, he said it with mm-hmm. different words, but that yep. is the same exact idea. All right, let's move on to uh, Mayo and Elliot Wolf. Greg, your thoughts? I well, I mean, from Mayo's comments and answers, and let's just say Mac Rowe was mentioned, but it was in passing in a grouping towards the very end. Yep. Um, I think in terms of the combine, it might have been or what have you. But it, in any way. In any event, Matt Groh was mentioned just in passing. Elliot Wolf, uh, Mayo used the term partner with Elliot Wolf. Uh, we found out yesterday that Elliot Wolf will be speaking at the combine uh, to the NFL media at large. It appears he's going to be the only one that Mayo's not going to speak at the podium at the combine. He might do something with New England reporters um, at some point. Uh, but, you know, just. Wolf speaking at the podium at the NFL combine, that is for major decision makers. That is yep. for GMs, team presidents, and head coaches. It's not for uh, some guy who doesn't have much sway. And and look, it, it, as we all thought, Elliot Wolf had a huge imprint on uh, the direction of the coaching staff, who Mayo talked to, who Mayo, Mayo hired because of his contacts, because of his years in the league. And there's no question in my mind that after yesterday hearing from Mayo, that it is Wolf and Mayo. Mayo's the head coach. Wolf is directing personnel and everything flows from there. I mean, they were like looking at across from the room to each other, kind of just, you know, winking, winking at each other. Mayo was winking at Elliot Wolf big time yesterday. (laughs) <laughs> look at us. Look at us. Look at us. So so just to just to put a finer point on what Greg was saying, paraphrasing, Mayo said once Elliot got here, we hit it off pretty much the first time we met. Oh. This is for this is love at first so sight. Cute. He's been a great partner in this. Um and, and then I thought the other part, the other part of what Mayo had to say regarding Wolf, this was something else that jumped out at me, Greg, because you and I both talked about some people were upset. You, I think both of us agree that the GM should have been hired first. Hire the GM. Yeah. Then the GM can hire the coach. And then that's kind of how it usually works out, right? So you'll get Adam Peters. He was brought in first in Washington. Sounded right. like Ben Johnson was his first pick, but but Ben ghosted him while they were literally in, in a plane heading towards Ben Johnson. What a weird story that is. But it's crucial, right, Greg, to have your GM – and your head coach aligned. And I thought when Mayo said, quote, from a team-wide perspective to individual players, our philosophies match. 
that's telling us, that's telling Patriots fans, Gerard Mayo, Elliot Wolf are looking at this team the same exact way. They're targeting the same kind of players. And I thought that was meaningful and great news coming out of that press conference. Yeah, there's no question that those two are aligned, that they have a good working relationship without question. And that's a great place to start for a coach and GM who have to be aligned. I mean, it's the, we've talked about it before in terms of, uh, you know, how the Patriots were going to look with how they were going to do things. And the big thing that you and I talked about, and it's certainly something that I believe um, through and through, and I've said it for years, the, the GM and the head coach have to be, they're a marriage and it can't be a shotgun marriage. And it can't be be really an arranged marriage. It's either the GM uh, picks the coach or the coach picks the GM or it's mutual. And here it seems like it's mutual, and that's a good place to start for the Patriots. Yeah, and I've been saying it from the beginning, and I'll stand by this, and I think it was made even you know obvious yesterday at the press conference. Once the Crafts went with Mayo, this kind of is what was going to happen. And whether you like it or not or I like it or not, they knew that Mayo had a good relationship with Elliot Wolf. And there was a report, I don't know who, you might have even written it, that Mayo was going to the scouts and stuff like that during the season. He was inviting guys from the scouting department into mm-hmm. you know his office and into some of the meetings. And t- so I know people, and look, I, I think they should have had a, 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 a search. They should have looked for a GM. They should have at least made phone calls. They should have gone through a search just like the head coach. But once they landed on Mayo, it made all the sense in the world to stick by Wolf because they have that relationship. All right, before we get into uh, Alex Van Pelt and the offense, let's uh, take a quick second here. Get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, because right now new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 bucks if your bet wins. Bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams with quick bets, live same-game parlays, exclusive props, and more. Just visit FanDuel.com slash Boston and shoot your shot. FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. On to AVP, Greg. I, I know that you said you didn't really, you know, there, there wasn't too much from Van Pelt. The most important part, though, about the offense, and I want to get your thoughts, was Mayo. And I did think Mayo gave us at least, at least some bullet points. And I think the bullet points that Mayo gave us during the press conference with this offense was, hey, look, we want somebody who can develop talent. We want somebody who has a good amount of deception within their offense. You know, Mayo mentioned when they would play against them, you know, the same concept, look a bunch of different ways. I think Mayo enjoyed that. He also talked about being able to adjust and adapt. And he also mentioned, Greg, third downs. He said, quote, third down is where you start to see coaches start to shine. So I thought that was kind of the bullet points from Mayo that we wanted from his introductory press conference. Developer, some deception, ability to adjust with the offense from week to week, and third down play calling. What does the OC bring to the table when it comes to that? Uh, I I don't disagree with you. I I do have a a couple positives and negatives from that. Like I, I disagree with Mayo about third down as far as offensive coordinators go. I think third downs is more of a defensive coordinator. Like if you you can come up with good stuff to get off the field, like that's most important. Third down offense is nice. um, But if you really want to be an effective offense, like you have to be more effective on first and second down where, you know, um, you know, if it's third and 15, there's only a, there's a, there's a limited amount. I mean, are we talking third and five or third and short? Okay. Right. Maybe. But so, I, I didn't love that answer. I did like his answer, and I and I totally concur with him about uh, how uh, Van Pelt, and this goes for all good offensive coordinators and play callers, is that they make the concepts, um, they, they make them look the same, but, but the outcome is different. And that's really the name of the game. And that's, that's when you talk about Matt Patricia when he, in his time here, um, people might look at it in hindsight after the Bill O'Brien season and say, well, they weren't that bad and this and that. Yeah, but it wasn't an offense. It was Matt Patricia was calling plays. 
to be a good, effective offensive coordinator, you have to see the thing in totality and say like, all right, well, we're going to build to this play. We're going to yep. run this run action out of the same set, but later it's going to look like this and they're going to get fooled. And so it's, it's, it's basically like composing a, a piece of music, being a really good offensive coordinator. Um, when Matt Patricia and other people who aren't good offensive coordinators, they're just banging buttons on a jukebox. They're like, well, I, I want to hear that song or I want to do. And, and that doesn't work. So I, I do, you know, positive and negative. I do think that that uh, that thing about um, how Van Pelt makes offense look, I, I think that's a good sign. And I do I do agree with them that that Van Pelt does that. What was your impression of Van Pelt? I liked him. I, liked I mean, him. he certainly and, and you hear this from everybody. Everybody loves Alex Van Pelt. He's a great <laughs> dude. He's the type yeah. of dude that you want to have a beer with. Um, you know, he he's he's great. I I I again, I love how I don't know if I love, but I liked how he talked about look, we can go in a bunch of different directions with the offense. Like, you know, we could be a zone blocking scheme, but if we have a really good puller, we're going to be a we're going to do more gap stuff. And you even saw that with the Browns who early on in Stefanski's tenure they were a huge zone blocking scheme, but they came more of a uh, a power team gap block gap scheme later in in his Browns tenure, and so um, and I do think that Van Pelt's ability to maneuver uh, showed last year with the five different quarterbacks and Joe Flacco, and so yep. uh, you know a, a good offensive coordinator is like a good cook. Um, you know, you you can't just say, "Well, I'm going to make." you know, X chicken dish like tonight. Well, what if you don't have the right ingredients? So you have to be able to cook on the fly. And it seems like Van Pelt does that. And he's extremely personable. And I do think that's another big takeaway that talking to all these guys and also some of the assistant coaches, they're all good dudes. And they're definitely changing the tenor of the building. Like I could just, I was going to ask a question yesterday, but I couldn't get an edge, a word in edgewise with some of the questions that were being asked about, you know, especially to DeMarcus Covington, um, you know, how has the vibe changed in the coaching offices um, since the, the the maneuvers that they made? And also, I wanted to know from him how the dynamic has changed between him and Gerard because DeMarcus and Gerard were basically colleagues for years. And DeMarcus was a coach before Gerard was even on the staff. And Mayo talked about how Covington helped him when he first came on the staff. Now Mayo's his boss. Like, yeah. That's a interesting dynamic that I would have liked to have heard his answer on. But again, I couldn't get to it. Yeah. Just a couple quotes from AVP for those who missed it. Uh, you know, he was asked about the scheme. He said, I wouldn't say it's going to be the same as the fancy scheme in Cleveland. He said, there will be similarities. And he really kept pounding the point, Greg, to, to go with what you just said about, you know, being adaptable and, and adjusting and, and using different talents. He said, I've taken pieces from a lot of different offenses over my time and kind of melded those together. What's best for us in that time? And he he was preaching, again, versatility, adaptability, done a lot of different ways, under center a ton, shotgun a ton, said issues with personnel in certain areas, been able to adjust. And he said, you know, it's not so much about scheme, it's about the players, which is similar to what he said during that Patriots.com video that was released last week. And I think some people were were confused by that. Like, oh, well, so you don't have certain players in mind? I want to see if you agree with my take on this. I think what Van Pelt is saying is, hey, look, in a perfect world, I would have player X at that position, and he would be able to do this, 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 and this. But it's not a perfect world. Mm -hmm. So, for example... Alex Van Pelt might love himself some Drake May. You're not guaranteed to get Drake May in the draft. So if you don't get Drake May in the draft, but you end up with Jaden Daniels because the scouting staff and everybody else thinks he can be really good, then Van Pelt's telling us, I know how to adjust with Jaden Daniels. Even though Drake May would be perfect with, with the vision of my offense, it doesn't mean that Jaden Daniels is going to stink. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. And I thought um, Van Pelt was, you know, basically my big comment on all of this is, you know, because I hate this time of year. I, I'll just say it up front <laughs> because there's no real news 
Okay. And people are on heightened awareness about like what their team's going to look like next year, what moves they're going to make. Yep. And it's also liar season. So, you know, you just, my advice to people is just take all of this stuff that you hear, especially from a podium or from some unnamed source, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, with a grain of salt. Like, yep. you know, Alex Van Pelt is not going to sit up there and declare Mac Jones the starter. And he said, you know, that it's everything's on the table. And he talked to Mac and people are going to be like, oh, well, is Mac the starter now? Like, we're, like, just relax. He, he's talking in, in generalities and, um, you know, everything will work out in the end. Completely agree. I wrote about on Boston Sports Journal last week, smoke screens. It's smoke screen season. Like you're going to hear oh. the Patriots being interested in everything, okay? They're going to be interested in a running back at some point in the second round. They're going to be interested in quarterback at the third pick, or maybe it's a tackle, or maybe it's a wide receiver, or maybe they're going to trade up, maybe they're going to trade down. You're going to hear it all. Uh, your thoughts on Mayo, Greg, talking about the relationship between the team and the media. I really wanted to get your thoughts on this. Obviously, being a guy who's – who's written for a long time, been a beat writer, and does the job that he does. What was your takeaway from from how Mayo handled things and addressing that and also how the team handled things yesterday? Um, well, uh, so, you know, you had the three interviews – or the four, uh, Mayo and the three coordinators at the podium. And then um, afterward, um, the Patriots Media Relations hosted what they called a media happy hour, and Stacey James kept banging on – the oxymoron of media and happy being in the same sentence about anything, <laughs> which is totally, totally legit. But I, he definitely liked that. He definitely uh, thought that was, uh, that was pretty, pretty funny, which, which it is. Um, I, I, just to declare, I, I only got there for like the last 15 minutes, got to introduce myself to, I think a handful of coaches and um, some front office people were there. Um, some people have to work around here. So I was busy um, reacting to Mayo's to the press conferences. Um, uh, so that was definitely interesting. It's something that I've seen done at, uh, at other places I've been um, both the dolphins and uh, the Packers at certain points in time have done stuff like that. Obviously it's completely new here and a foreign concept. Um, Mayo talked about, the relationship with the media he said, hopefully we'll get a chance to really vibe and connect. Uh, they, that he meant his assistant coaches know that our relationship with the media is very important. I think there needs to be a good relationship between the two groups. So that was his quote on that. Um, it's hard for me to really, uh, hard for me to really voice an opinion on this. Cause I don't want to come off as not grateful. Um, it's definitely, there's definitely a sea change, and I'm sure the crafts were interested in this from the way Bill Belichick does. Um, my my only wish is a happy medium um, in terms of the relationship between the coaches, especially the head coach and the media. I, I don't need it to be – I don't know if I need to really vibe and connect with the coaches. I think that's a <laughs> slippery slope. I'm sure some will take advantage of that and like the idea of that. I'll just tell you up front, it makes me very uncomfortable. It makes me very uneasy. Yep. I've been doing this a long time. I've been doing it a certain way. I'm 50 now. Like Bill Belichick, it's tough for me to change my tricks. Um, I just want to cover the team honestly, fairly, and tough. Um, and I'm not going to pull any punches because I might have a, a conversation with somebody. I'm just not. I'm going to tell it the way that I see it and the way that I hear it. Um, that's just the way I do things. And, but I just want, I just want there to be a happy medium in the, between Belichick and us vibing and connecting. I just think there just needs to be respect there. Uh, they need to know where we're coming from, which I think we're going to have those kind of conversations so that I can speak to Gerard and we can talk about, you know, where I'm coming from, what I've reported in the past. I'm sure we'll talk about, um, you know, things like that. I just want to, I'm, I'm upfront and honest. And if he asks me a question, I'm going to answer it directly. And, um, you know, I expect the same from him. I will say this on a related note to this, Nick, one of my takeaways from hearing Mayo, both at the press conference, the opening press conference and this, it's just, and I don't know what you think about this. And, and I don't know if this makes a lot of sense. So you'll have to tell me, 
Um, and I, and I sort of wrote this on BSJ um, after Mayo's press conference is that I think Mayo's going to have to readjust how he deals with the media, at least in press conference settings, because what you have to understand is Gerard Mayo came from Tennessee, big man on campus. Um, college media is college media. Um, he came here for the New England Patriots and was a great player almost from the start and was a multi-year captain. And he had the reputation, and really this is a fact, he gave up. He, he wasn't great with the media. He gave a lot of sor- short responses, sort of like, uh, you know, when you're a player, when you're a player and you're a great player, or you're a coach with a bunch of Super Bowl titles, like you could talk to the media any way you want to. Yeah. Um, it really doesn't matter. You've earned that, and people will be like, okay, well, that's just the way they are. Um, when Now he's a coach with no history, no success. He's no longer the player, Gerard Mayo, that basically gets to say what he wants and walks off the podium, and that's that. Um, he, he is now... Zero and zero as a head coach. Um, he, he, I think he just needs to realize that like the way he answered questions as a player won't be great when he's a head coach. And look, he just got the job. He's learning on the fly. I'm sure he'll learn it eventually. But uh, I think that's a lesson that he's going to have to learn as he goes along. I honestly didn't pick up on it as much as you did. Uh, I think the last thing you just said, though, it was going to be my point. It's a learning curve. And look, n- not everybody's good. Honestly, like you could have a great coach who's not the greatest with the media. You can have a bad coach who's fantastic with the media. If you thread that needle, you get a great coach and somebody who's great speaking and, and understands the game. And so we'll see. G- Gerard is going to have to learn. I'm sure the Patriots are going to work with him on this. Um, you know, just the idea of how to handle certain questions and and how to get in and out of certain things. So uh, I think it is going to be a learning curve. Uh, you know, Nick, as one thing far- on that. Sure. One one thing on that, I just wanted to mention, like, for example, my Robin Glazer question. Um, this has been an elephant in the room since following his introductory press conference. Uh, word leaked about that she's assistant to the head coach and she's yeah. in all the interviews and stuff like that. And this is a month later. And he sidestepped the question because he said it was really about the assistant coaches. Like, this is what I mean. Like, you don't get to. T- this is a press conference. This is a media press conference. Right now we dictate what the questions are and what direction. I mean, you can guide us a little bit, but he should have been prepared for the question and just should have answered it because it's been an elephant in the room. He could easily just say, Hey, look, she's doing a lot of the same things bears did. I'm really new at this. She's taken some things off my plate. Um, but you know, her role's sort of going to evolve as we go along here. Uh, but, you know, she doesn't have a whole a lot of influence on the day-to-day dealings with the team. Just something along those lines. But just to sidestep it, it just makes the, the, the mystery of who Robin Glazer is and what kind of influence she has. And, you know, is she just there for ownership as, as their eyes and ears? Um, it just keeps going on until, the, until we finally get an answer from Gerard. I didn't have much of an issue with how he handled the Glazer thing. And I know it was your question. And could he have answered it better? Sure. He could have given us more. Absolutely. No doubt about that. But maybe he's concerned about if I open my mouth and I start talking about Robin Glazer, then this is going to bring in a whole nother thing. And this is going to be, you know, maybe he wanted to cut it off at the pass and he could have done a better job at that. He, he Again, he can refine his skills for sure. But I think that was his way of pretty much just de-emphasizing Robin Glazer. You know, if if I sit here and I address her and I talk about how involved she was, certain people are going to take certain things out of that and it becomes a monster. So I'd rather just say it's about the important people here, but not say it that way (laughs) because then that's really, you know, just pretty much crapping on the whole thing. But, Mm -hmm. you know, I want to pay attention to the coaches. It's about the coaches. I I didn't have much of an issue with that. My final question about the press conference, it's a quick one. Were you afraid of Jeremy Springer's energy? (laughs) Uh, A little bit. I just came away thinking. I came away thinking, I think as soon as he stepped off the podium, I said to Chris Price, who was on my right, I was like, he's a special teams coach. That's for sure. Yep. Lots of uh, lots of energy. My guy was very excited. He was happy about everything. Um, so, Hey, I, I hope I wake up tomorrow feeling more like Jeremy Springer 
than I usually feel as Nick Cattles because that guy was happy. All right, Daniel Jeremiah, one of the best in the business, NFL Network. Everybody knows who he is at this point. He had a, a media call session. These are always cool. And I want to bounce off first one of the deals that he talked about. He said he talked to people around the league, Greg, and the idea of the Patriots trading down to the Giants, it would take the Giants to give up three second-round picks to move from six to three. Are you in on that deal if you're the Patriots? Is that enough? Now, I, um, I was just looking um, at the Giants draft picks, and I'm just going off of what I see on the Internet, so this could be wrong. But they, from what I understand, they have 6, 39, and 47. So 39 and 47 would be second-round picks in this draft. If the Patriots did that pick, I assume the third second-round pick would be a future second-round pick. Um, at first blush, when I saw three third round, second-round picks, I was like, hell no, no. I need an extra first for sure that they're two, you know, top 50 second round picks this year. Uh, I would have to think about it, but that I would like that. I don't know. I really want a future first and I, I don't want a second next year. A future second is more like a present day third. Like, I just don't think that's enough. If you're a wolf, you would probably look at it and say, Hey, that would give you the flexibility if it is 34. You'd have 34, 39, 47. Would give you the yeah. flexibility to move one of those seconds in a pick later on or a pick next year to move back into the first round this year. And maybe yep. Elliot would look at it and say, well, we don't get the future first, but we do get extra flexibility this year that would allow us to move into the first round of, of this draft. And we know the guys in this draft, right? Like we know – that tackles are deep in this draft. We know wide receivers are deep in this draft. So maybe he'd look at it that way. Uh, but an interesting, interesting thought. All right, Daniel Jeremiah also said that the Pats should take a quarterback at three. Here's what he said, Greg. To me, it would be tough to pass on a quarterback. There's no guarantee to be up here again. Three guys are worthy of consideration here. Being at Gillette last year, I didn't recognize it. It was just so flat. It was a boring team, no excitement. One of these top three quarterbacks, and of course he's talking about Williams, May, and Daniels, could bring new life and a new chapter for the Patriots, unquote. I think he's been listening to this podcast because that's basically, <laughs> I think, where the both of us are. Like we said, it depends on the evaluation. If you think the guy has a really good chance to be a franchise quarterback, um, whether it's this coming year or in a year from now with development and maybe sitting some, then I think you need to seriously consider taking the quarterback, um, you know, because of where you are and you hopefully will never get a, another opportunity to be this high again. And so I agree with their Daniel Jeremiah. I do think that he mocked Marvin Harrison to the Patriots at three, but um, I think he, he, I agree with his thinking that the Patriots, if they, if they have conviction on the quarterback, I think you got to take the quarterback. One thing AVP talked about a lot during the press conference was leadership. What's the balance, Greg, to you? Like, obviously, you don't want to take a, a guy who's totally off the grid, right? <laughs> like, totally off the off the reservation. You're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. But, but what's the balance between, okay, this guy might need some maturity, and holy shit, this guy is just, we can't do it, especially at number three. How difficult of a balance is that for these guys to figure out? Yeah, I mean, that's going to be one of the things to drill in. I mean, to me, um, looking at a quarterback, one of the I think one of the first questions you ask and it's sort of where you start and then you get into the skills later and you look at, all right, his ability against pressure on third down, like all this bull crap. Um, really, the first question you have to answer is sort of a pass-fail for a lot of these guys is, are people going to follow him? Is he a natural leader? Is Are people going to believe in this kid? And I think that it's it's one of those questions that maybe they didn't ask enough on Mac Jones. Um, so I think it's I think it's I think it's huge as a quarterback, as we saw with Brady, um, that ability to lead people that people just naturally want to play for the guy. I think is if it's not the top quality that you need to possess, it's right up there. Jeremiah also spoke about Wolf. I'll give you the quote, and then Greg will give you his thoughts. Quote: We scouted twenty years ago on the West Coast. He was always someone who worked hard. He started at the bottom and worked his way up. Easy, Drake. Uh, the Patriots were always one of the more niche drafting teams, always obsessed with fit, and may have taken players early 
They were always outside the lines. I don't think Elliot will do that, unquote. 100%. That that's Elliot Wolf and we talked about it early on. I talked to um I talked to somebody who worked intimately with Elliot Wolf and and I asked him like, you know, what's the what's the big thing? And this might have been it might have been John Schneider, the Seahawks GM that I spoke to about this. But I also think John Dorsey via text um also echoed this is that the number one commandment for the guys out of the Packers was don't reach for need. And don't get too obsessed with fit. Just take the best football player available. Yep. And I think that's one of the things the Patriots had <clears throat> forgotten and minimized um, in recent years and has led them to this point. You want one example of that. I, I don't think there's a, and maybe Greg, you have a better example than I do. But when I think about draft approach, you look at the Patriots way and you look at the Ravens way. You know, DaCosta, he's like, hey, I'm going to get the best. Whoever's there, that's great on the board. Kyle Hamilton a couple of years ago. Yeah, we'll take him. Zay Flowers, absolutely, we'll take him. Just take the best player available. Don't overthink it. Don't put yourself in a box. And you do get the feel that Belichick at times, if not most of the time, especially late in his drafting life here in New England, he put himself too much into that box at times. And Cole Strange is probably the best example of that and the trickle down of how they handled the guard position. All right, we got more coming up. Even guys like, just real quick, even guys like, you know, Juwan Williams, you know, that was a – yep. Let's match up with tight ends or this or that. Where when you they didn't have, and and there are other guys, you know, whether it's Jordan Richards or you know, there's a bunch Tavon Wilson. There's a bunch of guys um, where they just didn't ask the simple question: Is this guy a good football player or not? Um, you know, they just got too obsessed with matching up in certain scenarios. Totally agree. Got more coming up in a minute, but uh, I've got to tell you first, this episode is brought to you by FanDuel, exclusive wagering partner of the CLNS Media Network. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. Also, check them out over at BSJ. Them, Greg, and Mike Giardi. They tag team the Patriots coverage. Obviously, a very busy offseason. we got free agency coming up in about two weeks. We've got the draft in about two months. And uh, it is a very busy time over there at BSJ, 50 bucks for the year. Let's close things out with this, Greg. Phil Perry said he spoke to an NFL offensive coordinator that had this comp for Drake May. Mitchell, don't call me Mitch, Trubisky. <laughs> um, the first point I'll make is that it is liar season. Mm-hmm. Um you just don't know where these guys are coming from. This could be, and I'm not saying Phil doesn't know or you know what have you. It's just this is this is how I would react to all these reports that this could be a guy who loves Drake May and is trying to get other teams off of Drake May. So you just don't know. But to me, I think the I think the comparison is silly. I mean, it, is it just because they both wore number ten at North Carolina? Because that's really where it stops for me. I think that that Drake May is a much more natural player. I think that his his stats, his turnover stats, um, third down stats, pressure stats were much better than than Trubisky. And some of the things, the shortcoming, and Trubisky was a one-year wonder at UNC, and, and Drake May is not. So, um, we're, again, what we talked about earlier, you're going to hear a lot of this bull crap. Just – Ignore it. Don't get too worked up over it, or it's going to be one very long draft season. <laughs> it's already going to be long, so don't make it longer. Mm-hmm. He's Greg Bedard. I'm Nick Cattles. We'll see what happens over the weekend. We'll be back next week. Until then, be well, be safe. Greg Bedard, Patriots Podcast with Nick Cattles. We done for the week. Peace.